All right, so y'all, you are in room two, and you are about to hear a talk on safer online sex, arm reduction, and queer dating tips. So if this was not your expectation, now is a good time to change rooms. And the talk will be led by Norman Shermas. Norman Shermas is a security and privacy arm reduction specialist. They work with activists globally, and they have a, fo a particular focus on sex workers, queer, trans, and gender non-conforming communities. Uh, Norman works as an independent consultant, and they are a member of the Open Privacy's Board of Directors. So you have the floor. Awesome. Thanks, Genevieve. Um, it's really great to be here at NorthSec and to have actually a day where we had a keynote that was talking about some of these issues of users and the talk right before with Alyssa talking about some of the ethics that are involved. So I really appreciate that this is um, here at this track um, in that sense. And before I actually dive into the topics, um, I wanted to start with a content advisory. And I know we have the code of conduct, but I want to just make, make sure it's clear that this is a sex positive talk that focuses on marginalized communities. Um, so my intention is to have this be an inclusive space that's free from stigmas around the use of tech um, for sexuality. And with this, um, since I'm talking about harm reduction, um, my work draws on examples of um, sex work, sex education, drug use, homelessness, in sort of a broad, big picture sense. And it's, there's nothing explicit or graphic in terms of discussions of sex acts or drug use, but I want just to give people a heads up that that's part of what we're gonna be talking about. So, actually as Alyssa uh, helpfully sort of framed things, I wanna have an idea of who's thinking about the users in tech right now. Is there anyone in the room that's actually working or aimed at users? So I see a couple people. Um, let's have like maybe one or two people just do a quick shout out of what they're doing. Arms and yeah. here. Please raise your hands because my visual memory is not the best. Oh, okay, well I'll go on the other hand. <laughs> I'm Florence, I'm working with Queeret. We're basically we're, uh, building website for queers in a, a feminist taking of way to give them a, 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 a was online if freely. Awesome. I'm, I'm Harlan, I work for the United States Digital Services and we're helping uh, member, people who live in the US better access government services of all kinds. Awesome. Yes. So other hand. Yes. Hi, I'm Maggie. I'm a Mozilla fellow this year, and I'm also Tor's user advocate. Um, and I'm also working on anti-harassment initiatives. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks everyone for who sort of shout out for sharing. Um, and in part, I, when I was thinking about this, is that we have also these sort of like large categories, and I'm not certain if everyone who sort of spoke up what their exact role is. But we tend to have like UI, UX designers. We have people on the product teams that are thinking about features. We have policy folks that are thinking about, for example, anti-harassment policies, what they look like. But the security team is generally not thinking about the user. Or if they are, they're thinking about the user in a way that might not be the most positive. You might be thinking about the user as um, a potentially malicious actor on a trusted network, using language like that. Insider threat, maybe, right? That's the sort of language that security folks use. So the question really comes down to, who's thinking about the user's safety, security, and privacy in tech? And this is the question that I've been interested in with my work in tech in particular, but it comes from before that, because I've worked within um, marginalized communities for quite a long time, and in those spaces, tech is not necessarily a solution, but it's sometimes a new form of oppression or a new risk that comes out. Um, so how are we actually sort of grappling with this? And we see examples that even though there are people who are thinking about this, they're not necessarily doing a good job. We see, for example, with Uber, they had sent out this email recently, which is a check your ride every time email to remind people to make sure you're getting into the correct Uber. Um, so that you know, they're telling you to check the um, license plate, the make model, the driver's photo. And it's actually, it's really nice that they uh, made this. 
But the context of why they made this email was someone got murdered for not getting into an Uber, for someone they thought it was an Uber, and it wasn't. And it also, the way that they have responded, it only focuses on a very specific scenario, one where the user is inherently at fault. It doesn't look at or talk about some of the other publicly discussed cases that have happened with things like driver assaulting users, with things like drivers going out of their way to make um, a higher fare, things like that. And I'm sure that some of this has to do with the question of liability, which I know, again, came up a lot during Alyssa's talk. Um, and that's something that is, I'm sure, again, in the back of the minds of all of these companies, with how can they do some of this messaging with that. Um, another example is uh, around what we talk about cyber flashing. So there have been uh, high profile cases of airdrop being used to send people images. So the, an example of what this looks like is the, the middle picture with the censored phallus. Um, there's a headline from, um, from Huffington Post that notes, you know, that, again, that this is a sexual offense. And a recent article from um, Rob uh, Pagoraro um, who's saying in this article that Apple could fix the airdrop issue with um, some technical fixes. And this has been something that has been an issue for like four or five years now. This is not a new issue. And it's really interesting because some of the technical fixes are not necessarily very difficult. Um, one of the things that Rob mentions in the article is you can have a time limit for accepting from everyone. Um, but most people often focus on the user should have known, sort of like terms and services, but, or the user has the control and they've just configured it improperly. So, you know, these are some of the people thinking about users in tech and security. And perhaps another high profile case is Grindr. Grindr's been getting a lot of flack recently, and um, most recently with uh, this article um, talks in part about the, the current case um, of Herrick versus Grindr in the US um, that's about um, a Grindr user whose ex created a fake profile and sent um, a bunch of people um, for hookups to, uh, to the plaintiff. And this gets into me like a very complicated case that involves what's the platform's liability with this that has now been a lot of discussion in, um, in the US and other places. But it sort of opens up this idea or this perception that with these sort of continued issues that platforms are not thinking or don't care about user safety. So how can tech or security better support user safety? And this is where I enter and I come from this approach of a harm reduction approach. And I know I'm not the first person to talk about harm reduction within uh, security. The, I think one of the earliest examples is in 2012, Violet Blue gave a talk about harm reduction, focusing on hackers as um, a, um, a population for harm reduction work. Has anyone seen that talk? <laughs> so, there's a, so there's only a couple of people. Um, so I'm, I just wanted to put that out there that there are other people to potentially go see, which is really great. Um, but I'm also taking a slightly different focus because I'm focusing directly on the end users of the app and not on um, the hackers themselves. And to start with harm reduction, I like to start thinking about where it came from. This um, tweet very helpfully to me and like succinctly notes that harm reduction was started by sex workers, queer and trans people of color, people who use drugs, people in the streets saving their own lives and all the intersections thereof, not by public health folks, um, and they note to sort of respect the origins, because when people talk about harm reduction, they immediately go to talking about public health, because the public health programming is where harm reduction has really entered into policy. And so those become the very easy examples for people to think of. But my own experience and approach really comes from working with marginalized communities and um, being a member of some of these communities. So, that's, I have potentially a different perspective than just this policy um, route. And my work is deeply indebted in that sense to these communities that I've been a part of. So the aspects of harm reduction and a quick and easy way of um, thinking about it is simply that it's aimed to minimize harm from activities. 
These activities are usually illegal, but they don't have to be. It's explicitly um, opposed to stigmatization and judgment around the activities. And this is a really important point because so often people who, for example, use drugs might be stigmatized and say that they deserve it, whatever happens because they're using drugs. Um, it's not about ignoring the harm that happens from activities, so it's very upfront about that. And it's about putting the power in the communities, those at risk, in their hands. And there's even um, recognition of new forms of harm that can come with harm reduction approaches. What I mean by that is for sex workers who carry condoms, if you carry more than like two condoms and you're stopped by police, that can be used as evidence of prostitution. So, um, you know, using uh, harm reduction methods, like using condoms when you're meeting with someone to have sex with them, can also then be a way to put someone at a new risk. So harm reduction is also upfront about that. The, the key parts um, also at sort of a higher level is that they're opposed to abstinence approaches. So saying that it's either this or that, you know, you can only have one or the other. And it also recognizes the larger structures and systems that are in play. And that means that you're taking an inherently um, intersectional approach or you're looking in a broad way at what's happening. What's harm reduction for a white sex worker might be different than what's harm reduction for a black sex worker because of the way that the police interact with the sex worker, for example. So part of this is that the fact that harm reduction inherently recognizes the power of pleasure. Um, and when I'm talking about pleasure here, I don't necessarily mean just sex, drugs. It can be a more abstract idea, like being able to dress or be the person that you want to be or how you feel you are. Um, or it can be, you know, the ability to take time off of work and just like have some downtime, right? Um, so when we, when we put things in this approach that says you have to either do something that's pleasurable or you have to be safe, most of the time people are going to do what's pleasurable. Um, and so it creates, again, this, um, this danger, potentially, where people might know risks, but say, essentially, fuck the risks because what's pleasurable is more important and no one's trying to tell them that there are other options. And so I'm going to run through about four examples of harm reduction programs um, to give an idea of what this looks like in practice. The first one are needle or syringe exchanges. And this is one of the classic examples of harm reduction. And when we think about this from a public policy perspective um, or a public health perspective, one of the goals of needle exchange programs is to reduce the spread of HIV, of hepatitis, and other bloodborne um, illnesses. And the basic idea with um, needle exchanges is you either go to a place or there's potentially like a van. Um, but you're able to give a used needle and get a new one, usually for free. There might be some like small cost involved, but the goal is so that way you're not sharing needles, and if someone's infected, you spread an infection to a lot of people. It's not trying to get people to stop doing drugs or other uses of needles. And initially, these were actually seen as illegal. People doing needle um, exchanges and syringe exchanges um, were, could get in trouble with the law because it was seen as supporting drug use, right? And, you know, part of this is, in, as things have moved forward, part of the goal of needle exchange programs has been to change the laws. So nowadays, most needle exchange programs are legal, and Canada has even started um, piloting needle exchange programs in prisons, which is uh, pretty radical, actually, that they're having this recognition and they're willing to sort of go that step. And that has like governmental support. Um, and so, the, so we, they've moved forward to make what they're doing more acceptable. And oftentimes people are working at um, destigmatizing drugs at large. So working on things like decriminalization or legalization. Another prime example of um, harm reduction programs are safer sex and reproductive justice. 
And usually people talk about this as just safer sex, but I think within the US context of what's going on right now with abortions, it's really important to note that part of this includes um, safe um, access to abortions and to other things um, that are linked to reproductive um, justice and to link to like family planning. That's also a big piece of harm reduction. So I'm assuming some people have had some variation or have been exposed to some variation of safer sex education through knowing that condoms might be a thing. But sometimes these also don't go far enough. There are additional types of um, protective equipment, prophylactics, like dental dams and others that people use. Um, there's things like PrEP, which is pre-exposure prophylaxis to help spread um, HIV, and that's been actually very effective. Um, and there's also having access to regular um, STD, STI testings to help ensure that you're not spreading infections. So those are some examples of um, harm reduction programs within the safer sex and reproductive justice world. Um, but there's also things that are, we'll say, human or behavioral practices that people are able to adopt. And this can include things like negotiation um, of sexual encounters prior to having sex with someone. And this is very common within kink communities to ensure that you have things like safe words set up. Um, so while you engage in sex that might be more dangerous, you're able to, um, or actually seen as more dangerous, to be able to sort of stop, pause, and, you know, seize the activity to help make sure everyone is okay. Um, it can include things like sex workers charging less for someone to use condoms um, because economics is a reality. Um, it can include things like not brushing your teeth or flossing before or after oral sex. And even though that's a relatively minor risk of exposure, um, usually when you brush or floss, you do have a little bit of bleeding in your gums. So again, there's all of these different types of sort of small practices that are built into the harm reduction approach. Um, and sorry, I'm not, I know I can do like a whole probably talk on the sex ed, but we're gonna like, you know, sort of move on. But if anyone has any of these questions, I'm happy to talk afterwards or around. Um, and another example, and this is moving away from the traditional examples that people talk about to talking about um, homeless communities. And a lot of my experience comes with working with homeless youth. And a drop-in center is a place that's not a shelter, but where someone can go during the day to get services. And some of the services that they provide are like access to food, clothing, medical supplies. It can be computers, so they can communicate with people, so they can create resumes. Um, it can be a mailing address. Um, in, the, in the US, I'm not sure how accurate it is in Canada, but in the US, mailing addresses are still a necessity to get certain parts of government services. Um, so having a, a mailing address is really important. Um, they can offer skills building opportunities. One of the, the places that I'm familiar with um, used to have a screen printing workshop, for example, where homeless youth can help um, gain actual like sort of vocational skills or learn how to do screen printing. And they, if they sort of did it long enough, they can also create their own art, so they're given opportunities at expression, and they actually made money off of this. So they gained not only skills, but they gained um, a form of sort of economic independence. And some of them will even offer street outreach um, after they're closed. Um, so they'll go out and they'll provide things like the um, access to food, the clothing, medical supplies. They'll provide that to people living on the streets who might not come into the drop-in center. And the last example I want to give is um, humanitarian assistance for border crossings. So this example is quite specific to an organization in Arizona called No More Deaths or No Mas Muertes. And they've hit the news actually um, recently in the US because the folks that are working for um, No More Deaths are being targeted um, for surveillance and harassment by police and other legal cases for doing this work. And what the work that they primarily do is sort of exactly what you see up here on the screen. They provide food and water for people crossing the desert. And um, having lived in the desert, I can tell you even in city centers where you can easily go and pick up water from like a gas station or a corner store, people die every year from dehydration and heat. So if you then imagine you're crossing a desert where you don't have that kind of infrastructure support, how important the water is for people to be able to 
stay hydrated, and continue walking. And at the moment, there's a lot of, um, again, a lot of conversations around what's, what's going on. There's a lawsuit about whether this is considered legal or illegal activities. The organization says that what they're doing is legal and they provide legal support or services. But it's an example right now of, what's, um, of some of these conversations sort of in real time as something that's not necessarily explicitly called harm reduction in the same way that other public health programs are is being debated. So harm reduction is inherently radical. Um, if you hadn't picked up on that, while we were talking about no more deaths, there's been this very strong xenophobic, um, anti-immigrant, anti-migrant rhetoric cropping up in the US and globally. It's not just in the US, unfortunately. And um, so while the media and other policy folks are trying to dehumanize people who are crossing, um, and part of this is language of saying, you know, illegals, um, that the goal of no more deaths, again, is simply to view them as humans who deserve to live and provide water. And that's really radical in this context and in this day and age. And harm reduction actually does exist in the, um, in the tech space as well. And so I want to show at least a couple of examples so that way we can, you know, see some of these ways um, that this is already being integrated. The first one is talking about sort of social media and privacy. Um, I have a tweet here that I um, wrote a while ago um, in response to um, research that Dragana Karin did on the surveillance and intimidation against people live streaming police brutality um, in the US. And the, the tweet's just simply noting how important it is to have access to live streaming and to social media platforms beyond just connecting people, because this is about preserving evidence, right? Um, and why people who have been advocating for delete Facebook, which has been a, such a common refrain, especially after the Cambridge Analytica um, conversation, um, just doesn't work in those situations. But it goes beyond just um, sort of preserving evidence. It links into the way that we think about connection as well. I, I, de I tend to do a lot of work in places where um, Facebook's free basics, which used to be called internet.org, is active. And what that means is that there's people who have free access to Facebook, they have free access to like Instagram, but they don't have free access to email. So things like Facebook become a very important way for people to connect to each other, to family, to family abroad, things like that. So when we talk about things like delete Facebook, we're also then assuming you know, there are alternatives that we have. And so part of this like, humanization process is noting these other sort of examples and thinking about these people you know, that we're not necessarily part of their group, but we can see them as deserving of connection in the same way that we are. The other example is talking about um, intimate images, what people might talk about as revenge porn. And a very common refrain I hear is, if you don't want um, your nudes online, just don't take them or don't send them. And this is, to me, a perfect example of this abstinence approach within tech. It's saying that you can either do something like you know, send, a, send a sext or you can sort of not. There's no in-between. And it ignores the way that sending nudes, send, um, sexting people, can be an important uh, piece of someone's self-identity. It can be a way that someone can help um, feel okay with their body and have body positivity um, in really, again, really powerful ways of um, identity and things that are really important beyond perhaps just pleasure and sort of uh, an intimate moment between, other, between um, individuals who are at a distance. And there's an organization um, called Coding Rights that has an awesome zine called Safer Nudes that talks about this and does a very positive, uh, a sex positive um, take on it. Um, so I highly recommend if you do sext or you're interested in um, safer ways in terms of talking with people about sexting to take a look at that zine. And I want to highlight also the Facebook's response to revenge porn because this was quite controversial, but they were actually trying to do harm reduction at a platform level. Whether they talked about it that way or not, that's really what was going on. And so Facebook's response, if you're not familiar, was 
saying, send us your nudes, and we'll hash the image, and if that hash appears, we'll like, stop it from being uploaded or spread. And again, it's really great that they're trying to, to do this harm reduction approach. It's unclear if um, they, A, they talk to people, um, and like sort of built and designed with them, and, as opposed to just talking to people and then building on their own. And it also ignores the fact of like trust and the role that trust plays in this and whether people actually trusted Facebook enough, especially with some of their other <laughs> sort of issues. But it, to me, it's a really great example of moving away from this conversation of perfect security or perfect privacy that we tend to talk about. Um, so before I jump into the case study, I just want to see if there's any questions about the harm reduction approach. Um, oh, the, yeah. If I can have a let's make it a video hashed and kept off of Facebook because it's revenge form porn, can't I also uh, submit the video documenting the police abuse and have that kept off of Facebook as revenge form? Sorry, I, I, I might I might not be following. Um, well, I, I can rephrase so the yeah. question was if we send some content to Facebook and we determine like this would be objectionable to have it shared uh, because it's an intimate photo well the same technology could be used to censor some other any content that they would deem unacceptable got it yeah I mean so yes so we're uh, the this comes down to what we'll perhaps say approaches right and this is where um, talking about the Facebook uh, revenge porn is we'll say an example, not necessarily an example that, want, that needs to be followed or the only way of um, you know, sort of going about this. Because like you bring up, there are, there are issues of them being able to potentially censor or use this as a way of um, having, you know, using let's say AI or machine learning, other things to automatically um, remove content. And some of this actually you saw with YouTube taking down uh, videos that were evidence of human rights abuses and war crimes because of like sort of AI and things like that. So again, in the same things that are used potentially for some of this harm reduction stuff can also be, we'll say, misused in sort of other ways. Um, the, the key difference um, or the key thing I would like to sort of promote with the thought of harm reduction is how harm reduction is aimed at uh, putting the voices of the at-risk communities um, at the forefront. So one of the reasons I noted it was unclear whether Facebook designed this with um, people who have had non-consensual spread of intimate images is because if they didn't really center those voices and design with them, I'm not sure whether that's going to be a long-lasting or a good solution, right? And so if our goal is to sort of really reduce harm and build something that will last, that's not going to necessarily be the right route. Does that help? Cool, we can talk afterwards. Um, so, okay, so let's, uh, let's jump into the, oh, sorry, was there another hand that I saw? Oh shit, sorry, my computer just uh, um, went to sleep. Um, so we'll jump into the, the case study in just a second. Um, and, so we're talking about queer dating apps here. And this work really comes from a project that was run by Afsana Rigot from Article 19 and uh, looking at um, apps and abuses that were going on in Egypt, Lebanon, and Iran. And so I want to like, also like, preface this right now that even though I'm the one here talking about this, there are so many other people that were involved in this project that um, I'm not necessarily gonna be able to name them in part due to like safety issues, um, but like this is not like me <laughs> doing all of this work. Um, and there was an entire coalition and people who like volunteer time um, to do this. So the background of this is it really started back in 2014. In Egypt, after um, Al Sisi took power, um, there, we had reports of using social media and apps like Grindr to trap gay people. And we were told that this was linked to um, geolocation. And at the time, you had Include Security had published their um, research on Tinder and geolocation, 
Another researcher created Grindr map that was able to identify and locate um, users of Grindr, and um, the apps had actually responded, or so the, the gay dating apps had responded. So like Scruff, Hornet, Grindr, all did like user safety awareness little pop-ups. And so we're jumping in and starting sort of slightly from that, or we designed from that. And we started with the users. That was, that was our main goal. Um, and we wanted to basically help them connect, queer folks connect in these countries, and if they want to hook up to do that, but our main goal is to understand, again, what's going on and how they're connecting. So our methods, we used a lot of different types of methods. Uh, landscape overview, so this is like desk research, um, tech usage and awareness survey, and again, that had heavy framing on geolocation features. That's probably the least qualitative part of our methodology. Um, we did interviews, um, including sort of group conversations. We had a legal review of court cases. We did security and privacy analysis, and we had this direct collaboration between the security privacy experts. Sorry, I just put experts in quotes because... Uh, there's lots of sort of questionable advice that's given, and the, the queer communities themselves. Um, and in particular for the, the interviews, those were actually run and helped designed by some of the different local groups that we worked with. Um, I'm not going to name them right now due to time, but if you are interested, um, there are a few that are public. Um, and so our initial results showed that it's not only dating apps that were being used for hookups and dating. And this was especially true in Iran due to censorship. And so things like Grindr were censored, so people tended to use things like Instagram, you know, because you use what you have available to you. Um, participants were largely aware of the risks. They were even doing things like GPS spoofing and sort of other methods to try and protect themselves. The GPS spoofing is a little questionable because sometimes People would root or jailbreak their phone, which could expose them to greater security risks. So that's like also part of this harm reduction approach is noting that by not giving advice, people could unintentionally putting themselves um, or making themselves insecure or putting themselves at greater risk or danger. There was also this tension between anonymity and the lack of trust among users. And I highlight this because we didn't really go necessarily anywhere, but I think this is a common conversation that's going on in all these platforms. How do you think about like sort of authentic authentication of a user beyond, let's say, like a password, right? So you can know if it actually is a person, if it's a bot, and then how do you build that trust in these digital spaces? And Perhaps in a fun way, the participants weren't only interested in digital risks. They wanted other information about you know, sex ed, legal as well. So I'm going to go through a couple key results. The first one is that participants wanted to use the apps despite the risks. And this is, I think, probably the most important result when thinking about why take a harm reduction approach. Um, the typical approaches to security were not addressing the participant needs. There was a lot of conversation about, like, why don't you use encryption? Why don't you just update your phone? And they were basically like, that's not, <laughs> that's not what's going on here. Um, and in part because the primary risk were other users on the platform. And so that's one of the reasons when you we're perhaps starting to think about why traditional security advice was not working is because they weren't thinking about the risk that the users were facing. They were thinking about perhaps, like, risks to the system, right? Um, and the app platform. So again, something like end-to-end -end encryption or using something like Signal or another secure messenger would have done nothing to mitigate the risk of the other user being malicious. And this one actually really surprised me, is that people liked the, the location-based aspect. And the reason that this surprised me, I think, is part because within the larger conversation around privacy, um, in the U.S. and Canada and Europe, we tend to be so anti-location-based services. We talk about it as creepy, all of that. But what we, what we were learning is that location is really important for safety decision-making. For some people, they want to be able to meet up with people in their area, so that way they can meet up in person. For other people, there was a risk because you might be able to be identified based upon your last name. Um, of having meeting up with people in too close of proximity. So you'd want to make sure to meet up with people further away. So you might not communicate actually with someone who's close to you. 
Um, oops. Uh, there we go. So, and so we also did, like I said, we also did this legal analysis. And Asana, um, the, pr the principal investigator, as I mentioned earlier, is the one who really developed um, this methodology around sort of looking at the evidence. But we can sort of think about it as legal forensics, trying to pick up the pieces of what we saw with what was being used to understand sort of what's going on and to be able to identify things to... Um, uh, ways to reduce harm from what's the evidence that's being used. And the, what we saw were that accounts were um, created explicitly for entrapment or identifying suspects. And so that can be people, we'll say, infiltrating a group message. Um, app screenshots um, and watermarked pictures. So some of the apps used to have watermarks um, were used for blackmail, potentially for like blackmail or also blackmail to arrest someone. And since the context that we're talking about did include checkpoints, having the presence of the app um, on the phone was a risk in itself. Because at a checkpoint, someone might take your phone, say, open it, and they'll flip through and they'll say, oh, you have Grindr or you have Hornet um, or you have these images. And so that was also a key risk. Um, perhaps like importantly and similar to some of the conversations with um, sex work and how sex work is policed, is that no sexual activity was needed for the arrests. So they had other ways of going around this. So even in places where um, homosexuality wasn't outright um, outlawed, they used other, um, other laws. And again, the, there were other ways of bending the laws or interpreting the evidence to be able to do arrests. So we found that understanding the digital evidence was actually an essential um, point to basically understanding sort of the adversary methods or what's going on. Um, and so if we hadn't done this, we couldn't have made some of the recommendations that we did. So and the, one of the key recommendations that we had was this app cloaking feature. And app cloaking is something that came from uh, work that was done by the Guardian Project. And the Guardian Project had designed for Android a way to change the icon of the app so it didn't look like um, you know, that original icon. And so again, it's basically just changing the app icon. And that was a key recommendation, especially for that part of having that presence of the app on your phone, um, to follow best practices for transport security. And I sort of chuckle as I say this, because if we think about what are the ethics involved and like trying to build some of these things in through the process, this is theoretically something that should have been done from the very beginning. Um, at the time that we did uh, the research and the conversations, none of the apps had used um, SSL pinning and, or certificate pinning, and um, I don't think any of them were even using HTTPS or secure transport for their images, for their media servers, um, which, is, which is huge when we know that images are being used as evidence. Um, Working with the local community is like a key one as well, and that goes to part to like centering those at risk, and increase the safety with the geolocation feature. And we provided some potential recommendations, but we also noted that this needs a lot more research. Um, so we, again, we were not saying to get rid of the location feature, which is part of the initial response in 2014. Apps would also, at that point in time, give you the option to turn off location services, so you're not reporting your location to the app. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, so within the implementation, what we had sort of done as results of this, I should say other than coming up with that list of recommendations, um, we actually worked with Grindr to implement some of the recommendations. And among the fun things that came out of that is a new method for app cloaking on iOS. Um, as I noted, the Guardian project had only done work on Android, but with the work that we had done, we had now, now again a new way of doing this for iOS, which was sort of new research or new feature in that sense. And the creation of non-tech resources. Again, these are things that were requested by, um, by the, the communities that we talked to. Um, so context-specific legal information, localized sex health fact sheets, and these were in the languages that they spoke. Um, so the question is, where do we go from here in terms of harm reduction? Like, what's, uh, how do we actually apply this in practice? And I think one of the first things is to recognize that security, privacy, and safety are not binary. And so again, there's not this idea of a perfect security or perfect safety or perfect privacy. That there are, there's a spectrum and that you know, people will do their own analysis around this. Um, focus on understanding and humanizing the users. 
So often, we, I think, so stigmatize and we don't think of the users as humans. And I know that this is part of the role of designers, but not everyone has designers. And even when we have designers, they're not necessarily doing the best job when it comes to the humanization part, in part because they're building personas and other things that develop mental models that might exclude other users, right? And so there is already a tension within design, and design itself you know, needs to be perhaps part of this conversation with that. There are no edge cases in this sense. I've been in enough conversations with security privacy folks where I've heard people talk about the most at risk or marginalized users as edge cases. And if we're thinking about dehumanizing language, this is a perfect example of that sort of dehumanizing language. We need to move away from stigmatizing user activities. Um, I'm sure I would not be surprised, I'm not gonna necessarily ask anyone to raise their hands, but I would not be surprised if there are people in this room who have thought or said things like, a user clicked on that phishing link that was so obvious, they're so stupid, why did they do that? Um, and that's an example, again, of stigmatizing user activities as opposed to trying to sort of understand and build with them. And this is the, this is the part that Alyssa um, had mentioned as well that we were talking about, which is incorporating user safety, not just system risks, into threat modeling and system design, some of those traditional security parts. Um, but of course, this brings up really that question of who owns user-centric security and privacy and safety within a company and within the structures that we have. Due to like where security and privacy teams are usually placed, they're under things like compliance, which is gonna you know, like shift that um, approach. They might be um, based within um, organization or company operations, which means that they're not thinking about the end user of the app or the platform. And even if they're based within, let's say, the product team, as in the product team's the one who is building this, they might not necessarily have the power or ability to sort of implement some of these things because the security team might need to be the one who signs off on everything. You know, so there are already some of those tensions even within where security and privacy can be placed. Um, there's obviously the design teams maybe have a role, the product or app teams could as well, and the, the product teams, we, those were actually the folks that we were talking to at Grindr. They were the ones that were sort of the owners internally. And I wanna perhaps leave with the question of what would it look like to bring harm reduction to your work? And I think this is an important question in part because I've talked so much about, we'll say these more uh, social scenarios, but I also strongly believe that harm reduction as an approach can be used and brought into the work that people do within corporate environments. And I would, I would highly encourage people who are in sort of enterprises or corporate environments to think about ways that they can bring in and incorporate harm reduction and the implications or what that means into the security work that they do. So I guess thank you and we'll go to questions.